you've probably heard a lot about LLMs or large language models that can understand language and respond to user requests accordingly. But have you heard of LMMMs or large multimodal models? If you haven't, you've definitely come to the right place. In this video, we're going to be talking about a really cool LMMM that came out recently called Mini GPT-4. These models not only understand language, but also understands images, and it can respond accordingly, like answering questions about a certain image or writing a poem about an image, even writing upon design characteristics of a given design. So let's dive in. Mini GPT-4 is based on another model called Blip2. Just like Llama, Blip2 has a really interesting backstory and it came out as an open source competitor for the multimodal version of GPT-4 that was announced in the technical paper. If you want to learn more about Llama, I encourage you to go and watch the video linked here. Let's understand a bit about Blip2 because that forms the basis for Mini GPT-4. Blip2 has three parts a vision encoder, something called a cube former, and a language model. Cube former here is the most innovative part as it aligns the vision model with the language model so they can communicate better and answer questions about visual content that's provided to this model. Let's understand this model from the perspective of the cube former. The cube former has two towers, one to deal with the outputs of the visual encoder and another one to deal with text. Let's call these two Q1 and Q2. Q1's input is a set of learnable query embeddings. Then the vision model encodes an image and produces an output. This output goes as an input to every other block in this particular tower. Q2 takes a text as an input. Q1 and Q2 has an attention mechanism which allows these two towers to communicate between each other. In other words, they can learn about images and text using this attention mechanism. And since the query embeddings are learnable, they can encode information about the image, which can be shared with the tower Q2, which is responsible for text via this attention mechanism. This sets up the stage nicely for why these query embeddings are there as learnable query embeddings. For me personally, I haven't seen many generating embeddings out of thin air to be fed into a model, which is not grounded on images or text. You can understand the purpose of the query embeddings here, right? Because these queries are learnable, they basically act as a bridge for the visual encoder and the language model to communicate between each other. Because the query embeddings can encode information about the image which can be shared with the text part of the model through the attention mechanism. During the inference, here's what happens. An image comes in, the image is encoded by the visual encoder, and then an output is produced. This output is taken by the cube former, along with the learnable query embeddings, to produce another output which we will call, which we will call the query representation. And this query representation is taken as a soft prompt along with the actual prompt or the question you want to ask this model. And this will be taken as an input to the language model, which it will use to generate the response. This is how Blip2 works. You can read more about this model in the paper linked in the description. There's also a linear projection layer, which helps to match the embedding size between the two between the visual encoder and the language model if there is a mismatch. In my personal experience, Blip2 generates really short and impressive responses for a lot of the questions I wanted to ask, so I wasn't really impressed by this model. But it's important to keep in mind that this model came at a time where we didn't have that many options as open source LLMs. So Blip2 has very limited capabilities in instruction following. So you might get a completely irrelevant response when you ask Blip2 a question. It also tends to heavily focus on whatever text 
that is present on an image if there is text present in an image. There is a model hosted in Hugging Face for Blip2. You can download that model and try it if you are interested in trying out this model. When I heard about MiniGPT4, I wasn't super pumped to try this model to be honest because of the experience I had with Blip2. But playing around with MiniGPT4 for a few minutes, it was able to quickly change my mind. And looking at the capabilities it has, it blew my mind that this is an open source model. If I want to explain MiniGPT4 in few words, it's a resurrection of Blip2, but it has enhanced capabilities compared to Blip2. It has been trained or fine-tuned using two stages to make the model more aligned with user requests and it can understand user requests well and follow those instructions. If you are interested in learning about the techniques they use to fine-tune the model, you can read the paper linked in the description. This video is focused on building the model. I will make another video assessing the quality of model outputs as a separate thing because building the model is not trivial. Mini GPT-4 has two versions. One version uses the 7 billion parameter model of Vicunia and the other one uses the 13 billion parameter model of Vicunia. In this exercise, I'm going to be using the 7 billion to restrict the compute resources I need. To get an idea about the exact compute requirement you need, you can check out the GitHub repo of the official Mini GPT-4. Specifically, I'm going to use an instance on GCP or Google Cloud Platform, which has about 30 gigs of RAM and a T4 GPU, which has about 15 gigs. This instance costs about 50 cents AUD per hour, so it's not too bad to play around with this model. The notebook for this exercise is available in my GitHub repo and you can download the notebook through this link provided in the description. First, what we are going to be doing is set up the environment. Mini GPT-4 repository provides, the, all the, provides all the libraries required and other dependencies as a convenient YAML file. All we need to do is install the libraries and the dependencies in this YAML file through Conda. Then we will create an IPython kernel so that we can play with this environment in a notebook. You can follow the instructions provided in the notebook in order to get this set up. Then we're going to be downloading two models. The first model you need to download is the Llama 7 billion version. The second model is called Vicunia Delta V0. If you don't know about the Llama model and want to learn about the background of it, I encourage you to look at this video. You might be asking right now, why do we need two different language models? It's because of the licensing issue. When Wikunia was released, they didn't have the licensing or permission to release the actual Llama weights. So what they did was they released the deltas that you need to apply over Llama in order to get the actual Wikunia model. Another big caveat you need to understand is you need to use the V0 model, not the V1.1 model. If you use the V1.1 model, you might get strange, unexpected responses. Initially, I actually used the V1.1 and for a while, I was quite disappointed with Mini GPT-4 because it didn't really understand a lot of the requests I made or generated strange, irrelevant responses. Then I realized that I should be using version 0 not version 1.1. In order to apply the weights, you can use this fschat library. It provides a convenient apply delta command. All you need to provide is the original llama weights you have, the Vicunia delta weights, and then an output directory where the model should be stored. Once you run this command, you would have the final fully functional Vicunia weights in that directory you provided. The next thing you need to do is download the mini GPT-4 checkpoint from Google Drive. Again, I have provided you the command here that you need to run and it should be downloaded to your working directory. Now you have all the ingredients you need to build the model. You simply need to run this cell and it should build the model for you. I also created a variant of the chat object that is found in the demo provided by GPT-4 repository. I found the original chat object and the demo are quite tightly coupled. 
I wasn't interested in running the model through the demo, but I wanted the model independently in order to test and play around with it. I, re I quickly realized that I can't really use the demo or the chat object to do this. So I created my own variant, which encapsulates all the model related functionality as well as the states. All right, that's it for building the model. Let's actually run some inference through this model to see if this model stands up to our expectation. In order to query the model, all you need to do is first upload an image through the upload img function. Ask it a question using the ask function. And finally, wait for the model to answer with the answer function. If you want to reset and start a new conversation, you can use the reset underscore history command. You can see a working example of these of the flow of these functions in this cell. In order to have a quick demo, I uploaded three images, a cake, an advertisement, and finally a logo. About the cake, I asked what is this and how do I make this? For the advertisement, I asked what's funny about it because it's supposed to be a funny advertisement. Finally, for the logo, I asked it to explain what is visually striking about that logo. In my opinion, MiniGPT4 generates some reasonable responses. You might not get what you see here because this is generated using a temperature and random sampling. So every time you run the model, you might get a different response. And you might need to play around with these generation specific hyperparameters in order to get the optimal response from the model. We will chat about this and analyze this in a separate video. In conclusion though, MiniGPT4 is quite capable of generating relevant responses to the questions that are asked. But what you need to understand is this is building the model and doing this quick demo is just the tip of the iceberg. You can do so much with this model. For example, you can play around these generation specific hyperparameters and strategies like you can choose beam search instead of nuclear sampling in order to generate the response. Or you could try more complex prompt engineering in order for the model to help the model to generate the response you need. As I said, I will create a separate video, so keep your eye out for this next video. That's it for building the model. I hope you enjoyed this exercise. Go and download the notebook and have a play around this model. I think it's definitely worth it. If you want to learn about machine learning concepts and cool technologies that are coming up, subscribe to my channel, Deep Learning Hero. I will see you soon with another exciting video.